Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, I'd like to inform all participants that today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. All participants will remain on a listen-only mode for the duration of the call until the question and answer session. At that time, if you would like to ask a question, you may do so by pressing star and one. I would now like to turn the call over to Linda Lee. You may begin. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Linda Lee, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the Exploring Census Data webinar series. For anyone who may not be familiar with our format, the Exploring Census Data webinar series is a set of webinars presented on a monthly basis based on popular topics. The webinars are presented by our subject matter experts with the opportunity for Q&A at the end of each session. Each webinar is recorded and posted on our site along with the PowerPoint and transcript for later reference. Today's webinar on finance statistics is the second in our series for this year. This is our third installment of the series. We have all of the webinars from our previous series archived on census.gov, or you can also access them using this link provided on this slide. In light of the recent transition to 100% telework, we are utilizing technology offsite to continue operations. We aim to minimize interruptions as much as possible, and we appreciate your patience if we experience any technical delays. Please utilize the chat feature to notify us of issues should any arise, and we will do our best to address and mitigate them. Also, please note all webinars and Q&A sessions are recorded and will be accessible from the Census Academy's webinar tab once the recording and transcripts are available. Today's webinar will be presented by Mr. Andrew Haight and Ms. Linda Laughlin. Mr. Haight is an economist with over 30 years of experience with the Census Bureau to include his current capacity as the project manager for the Census Business Builder. Ms. Laughlin is a statistician with our demographic program in the Social, Economic, and Housing Statistics Program. So our first objective today is to provide you with information on the types of data that you can obtain related to the finance sector, also known as Code 52 under the North American Industry Classification System, also commonly referred to as the NAICS. And in a moment, we will provide a brief overview of the system for anyone who may not be familiar with how we classify. And knowing that the availability is powerful, accessing the data itself can sometimes be a challenge. Our second objective is to show you how to get the data, and we've included a section towards the end to help you find what you need. In today's webinar, we will go over a high-level overview about the Census Bureau and the structure of our programs. Then, we will dive into the data from our programs with finance statistics, so you can see the types of data that you can obtain. From our programs, we will be covering the quarterly services survey, the county business patterns, the economic census, the annual capital expenditure surveys, and the American Community Survey. After showing you the data, we will go into how to access our data and then close out with a Q&A section. The Census Bureau is the federal government's largest statistical agency. We conduct over 130 surveys each year with our well-known surveys listed here. Collecting data on the nation's people is the decennial census, which takes place every 10 years. Activities surrounding the 2020 Census is currently taking place. At the end of this webinar, we've included contact information in case you may have questions on the 2020 decennial. Next, the American Community Survey is a program that collects demographic data annually. In a moment, Linda will dive into more details about this program. For business statistics, the Economic Census is our most comprehensive program, taking place every five years in the years ending in two and seven. We also have the Census of Governments, which is the public counterpart of the economic census. A pyramid is a good illustration of the relationship between time and detail from our business or economic programs. We primarily conduct monthly, quarterly, and annual surveys. In looking at this pyramid, it's important to know that the more current the data, the less amount of detail. With more details available from programs categorized in the middle and bottom of the pyramid, with that being said, the Economic Census is a periodic survey that takes place every five years. It is illustrated here at the bottom of the pyramid because it is the most comprehensive program when you're looking for business data. As you move up the pyramid to our annual programs, you'll find that you can use these statistics for analyzing trends. And finally, at the very top of the pyramid from monthly and quarterly programs is where you can obtain timely data. And before I turn the presentation over to our presenters, here are some key terms and items that are helpful to know when you use our data. First is
is the North American Industry Classification System, also commonly referred to as the NAICS. The NAICS is a system that we use to classify every business in the United States and is the primary dimension of business employment data that you'll see today. Each physical business location is assigned its own six-digit NAICS codes based on primary, primary business activities at that location. Each individual business data are then turned into summary statistics that we publish by industry and geography. In the reference section, we've included slides that illustrate the system. And if you'd like more information beyond the reference material, please visit our site, census.gov, where you'll be able to access additional materials. Next is the term establishment, as opposed to company or firm. Most of our employment data is collected and published on an establishment level. Collecting the data this way allows us to provide the most accurate picture of business activity. So for instance, if a company has both manufacturing and retail locations in many states, separate data is captured for each location and not the company as a whole. If we didn't collect data this way, we would lose the accuracy and ge geographic and industry detail. Third, we collect data from both employer and non-employer establishments. Some programs only cover employer businesses while other covers both. Employers are businesses that have at least one paid employee, while non-employer businesses have no paid employee. Depending on the industry you are looking at, the non-employer statistics could represent a big portion of the sector. For instance, in the finance sector of the economy, we have a large number of establishments that are non-employer businesses. So it's good to be aware of this distinction. Finally, we are bound by Title 13 and 26 to uphold and protect privacy. As a result, we are able to provide high quality data because respondents are more likely to provide information knowing that their privacy will be protected. And now, it's time for me to turn over the webinar to our first speaker, Mr. Andrew Haight. Great, thank you so much, Linda. So as Linda said, my name is Andy Haight. I'm an economist at the Census Bureau. And today I'm going to be talking about the business data that we provide in three of our programs for the financial insurance sector. To provide a little bit of background, um, what you're seeing on your slide right now is the definition from our NAICS website of the financial insurance sector. You can see that this sector primarily comprises establishments that are engaged in financial transactions. So this would include businesses like banking, but it also includes insurance carriers and other kind of financial investment types of vehicles. One type of business that is also included in this sector is our central bank. Um, we actually publish data on the central bank in a few of our programs, and it is excluded in a few others. Now, of all of the different surveys that we conduct at the Census Bureau on our business side, these are the surveys that provide data for the financial insurance sector. And the short answer is no, I'm not going to be covering each and every single one of these. The webinar would be three hours long if we did that. So today we're going to focus on three of them. From the first top part of the pyramid that Linda talked about, I'm going to talk about the quarterly services survey. This is one of our economic indicator programs that provides very timely data on the services sector, which includes financial insurance. Moving down to the middle of the pyramid that she talked about, we're going to be talking about data from county business patterns. This is one of our annual programs that provides data on employer businesses. Now, while I'm not going to talk specifically about non-employer statistics, that is the program that primarily provides detailed information on the self-employed people. And I will mention a couple of times um, the importance of non-employers in the financial insurance sector. Also, as part of a spotlight, I am going to focus a little tiny bit on the American, or excuse me, on the Annual Capital Expenditure Survey, or the ACES program. This is our spotlight survey uh, for today's webinar. And then finally, I'm going to be closing out my portion of the presentation to talk about the economic census, which is one of those programs that is at the base of the pyramid that Linda talked about. So with that, let's get started on the quarterly services survey. This is our economic indicator program that provides service industry data, um, which includes timely estimates of revenue and expenses by industry. The Quarterly Services Survey is related to the Services Annual Survey, or SAS, um, and in fact, QSS serves as a subsample of that particular program. 
The, the program itself publishes two main statistics, total operating revenue and total operating expenses. As you can see in the description, the total operating expenses data just covers um, data for tax exempt firms in industries that have large not for profit components. So when you think about industries that have a lot of non profit businesses, we publish data on tax exempt firms on total expenses in that particular category. Now, the data that are published in all of our economic indicators are published both seasonally adjusted and not adjusted. And that certainly applies to the quarterly services survey. When you're looking at the non-adjusted data, you're actually looking at the reported statistics for the businesses. Whereas when you're looking at the seasonally adjusted data, these statistics have then been adjusted to account for the normal fluctuations that occur from month to month, from quarter to quarter, and from year to year as part of seasons. And very often, looking at the seasonally adjusted data, you're able to see things that are changes that are above and beyond or that are outside of the normal types of changes that you would expect to see. So for example, when you think about child daycare services, this is certainly a seasonal industry in that there are certainly months where child daycare services businesses do really well. Kids are in school, um, kid, parents are working, kids go to daycare after school. But then in the summertime, you see that the sales and revenue and expenses of child daycare services decline because parents take their kids out of daycare and they go on vacation. The quarterly services survey is also just like some of our other economic indicators in that the data that you're going to be seeing are published only at the national level. There are two of our monthly and quarterly programs that do provide data below the national level. That is our building permits and our, and our international trade data, but the quarterly services data are just available at the national level. Now this slide talks a little bit more about the quarterly services survey. Again, it's a quarterly program. Uh, we do the mail out at the end of each calendar quarter. Um, and currently the last data that is available right now is from fourth quarter 2019. The first quarter 2020 data is scheduled for release on May 20th. And I'm certain that many of you are going to be very, very interested to check on, uh, to check on the progress of this program, uh, are going to eagerly anticipate the release of this data on May 20th, because this is going to be our first real glimpse into the effect of COVID-19 on the services sector economy. Some of you may have just noticed that last week we released the monthly retail trade report that showed a significant decline from February to March um, in retail sales. I'm very curious to see what we're going to see in the first quarter of 2020 from the quarterly services survey. When you think about the timeliness of this survey, the, the advanced quarterly services report is released about 50 days after the calendar quarter ends. So about 50 days after the end of fourth quarter 2019, we released the data for fourth quarter 2019. About 50 days after the first quarter 2020 will end will be when we'll be releasing the data from the advanced services report. And these data are released online. The final, the non-advanced, are released about 75 days. So we add about 25 more days to further review the data going from the advanced report to the regular quarterly services report. And these data are all available in something called our, called our Economic Indicators Dashboard. I have provided access uh, to the link here. As a reminder, uh, these PowerPoint materials are going to be available to you after the presentation, so you don't have to frantically be writing down these URLs. Now this slide provides a little bit of information about the types of industry levels that are covered by the quarterly services survey. On the right hand side of the slide, you can see the complete coverage, the NAICS, the NAICS sectors that are covered by QSS. Financial insurance is highlighted in red, but on the left hand side, you can see the actual two, three, and four digit NAICS codes that are particular that are covered. This quarterly services survey is similar to a lot of our other economic indicator programs in that it doesn't publish the full two through six digit detailed data that are available in the annual programs and in the economic census, which you'll be seeing in just a few minutes. 
uh, but it does provide a really good amount of detail, even at the three and four digit level. So these next few slides just give you a glimpse into some of the data that we've recently published from the quarterly services survey. This is looking at data from first quarter 2013 to fourth quarter 2019. And you can clearly see on the left-hand side the increase, the gradual increase in revenues, um, not seasonally adjusted revenues for depository credit intermedi intermediation, or what we typically think of as banking. That's the chart on the left-hand side for NAICS 5221. And again, we're looking at the not seasonally adjusted data. On the right-hand side, I changed the industry to NAICS code 5241, and this is looking at insurance carriers in this case. Again, the same period, first quarter 2013 through fourth quarter 2019. And again, you see a similar sort of increase. Uh, I was sort of interested to see that while there was a small decrease in the revenue for banking going from third quarter to fourth quarter 2019, you can notice how we have this little dip from the green bar here at the end to the purple bar, the next one. We don't see that same sort of dip for insurance carriers. Now, in addition to showing data in this bar chart format in our, in our economic indicators dashboard, we also have the data available in a line graph format. So on the left-hand side, we have data for NAICS 5231, securities and commodity contracts, intermediation and brokerage. Again, looking at not seasonally adjusted total revenue data from first quarter 2013 to fourth quarter 2019. And you see this real volatility in the, in the revenue of these businesses from quarter to quarter. If we had looked if we had changed the type of data we're seeing from the not seasonally adjusted to the uh, seasonally adjusted data, you would see a lot of that volatility in this industry level out because a lot of this is just sort of the normal up and down trends that occur. On the right hand side is a scatter plot that we have that is looking at data on percent change. And you can see we highlight these changes that are significant versus those that are not necessarily significant. So you can see some periods where there was a fairly small change um, from month to month or quarter to quarter, excuse me, um, that was not statistically significant, whereas the, the items that are in the purple circles certainly are statistically significant. So that talks a little bit about the quarterly services survey. Again, the program provides data at the national level only. If you're interested in data for the financial insurance sector at the, at the state, at the metro, and at the county levels, then you'd want to turn to the next program that I'm going to be talking about, which is our County Business Patterns Program. County Business Patterns, or CBP, is one of our annual programs that provides detailed statistics at the full two through six digit NAICS industry level. Um, it is the complete hierarchy. And again, this program covers businesses with paid employees. So those non-employer businesses that Linda talked about, the self-employed people, are not covered by county business patterns. The statistics that are published in CBP include basic data on the number of businesses, or what we call an establishment, employment, first quarter payroll and annual payroll. So you will notice that we do not publish data on receipts or revenue or sales in county business patterns. For that, you would need to turn to a program like the Economic Census, which provides that detailed um, information, or to the monthly, uh, or excuse me, the quarterly services survey that provides revenue, but again, only at the national level. Now, amongst the 58 programs that we conduct in the Econ Directorate, most of them are conducted from data that we actually collect from the businesses. But there are a couple of programs where we pull in administrative data from other federal sources to use as the source of data for that particular program, and CBP is one of those. The data that we pull um, to do, to actually, to actually tabulate the county business patterns report comes from administrative records that we receive from the Internal Revenue Service, the Social Security Administration, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, we also have some information that we pull in from the economic census and what we call the COS, the Company Organizational Survey, that are used to ensure 
that we have the correct NAICS classifications for all the businesses that come into our County Business Patterns Program. So just to give you a snippet of some information from the 2017 County Business Patterns, I've included some key stats for this industry over on the right-hand side of the slide. You can see that in terms of numbers of businesses, there's about 193,000 credit intermediation and related activity businesses with about 2.9 million employees and about $232 billion in annual payroll. By comparison, the securities, commodity contracts, and other financial investments and related activities industry has fewer um, establishments, only about 103,000, almost half, and about 904,000 employees as opposed to the 2.9 million that we saw for credit intermediation. Finally, the third industry I have here at the bottom is insurance carriers. Uh, NAICS 524, about 180,000 businesses in the U.S. with about 2.6 million employees and about $211 billion in annual payroll. Now, county business patterns data, as I was just saying, is published by geography by, and by NAICS, but the data are also published by two other key dimensions. We publish data by legal form of organization, um, which would be things like corporations, partnerships, proprietorships, et cetera. And we publish data by employment size class. So a lot of times I get users saying, Andy, I need some information on small business in America. What does census have that will help me understand the importance of small businesses in the U.S.? County business patterns data publishes information on the employment size of each individual establishment and they're shown in size classes. Businesses with one to four employees, five to nine employees, 10 to 19, 20 to 49, 50 to 99, et cetera. We provide the data in those size classes to allow users to make their own decision about what constitutes a small business or a medium-sized business or a large business. You could aggregate those different size categories to your own definition. So if your definition of a small business is an establishment that has less than 50 employees, great. We've got the data to be able to do that. If your definition is, is, is businesses with less than five employees, we have that data as well. Now this is one of our only econ programs that provides complete and consistent county level data, not only for the United States, but also for the five U.S. territories, which includes Puerto Rico and the other four island areas. Guam, Northern Marianas, American Samoa, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, the data are shown, again, at the national, state, county, metropolitan area, uh, and even zip code levels. And fairly recently, we even added congressional district level data. So this is available as well in our My Congressional District tool. This slide provides some information about where you can go to get access to the data. I've highlighted the key data program here at the very top, our brand new data.census.gov application. I believe Linda is going to be my, Linda Laughlin, my colleague, is going to be doing a quick demo of data.census.gov. Um, but this is going to be a great resource to access those county business patterns data. And you can see the other formats that we have available as well. So just to give you a snippet of some information for the financial insurance sector, the next couple of slides just give you some quick data. So the top chart we're looking at is for credit intermediation businesses. And as you can clearly see, when you think about the legal form of organization, C corporations and other corporate legal forms of organization clearly dominate in this particular industry. 130,000 of the 193,000 credit intermediation businesses are C-Corps. You can see much fewer are the S-Corporations, and then finally you get down to nonprofits, partnerships, and individual proprietorships. On the other hand, the chart at the bottom shows securities establishments, businesses that, that sell securities. Of the 103,000 security establishments businesses, you can see this fairly even distribution between partnerships, C-Corps, and S-Corps. So the legal form organization data can be really valuable to understand the composition of the businesses that make up a particular industry. This is a, these two slides give you some information about the size type data that we have available. At the top of the slide, you can see information on the number of insurance carriers by employment size class, 
you can clearly see that the vast majority of insurance businesses are small businesses. 124,000 of the 180,000 uh, insurance carriers in the U.S. have less than five employees. These are the little insurance offices that we see in shopping centers and in your local communities that sell insurance to people in those neighborhoods. And you can see this rapid drop off in the larger size category. In fact, I don't believe there are any insurance carriers that have more than 249 employees. On the other hand, when you look at the, the um, excuse me, not, not zero, it's a very small number. However, when you look at the average annual payroll per employee of those insurance carrier businesses, on average, they earn about $81,000 a year, but those vast number of businesses that have less than five employees earn the lowest average annual payroll per employee of about 51705 The peak, um, the, the insurance carrier businesses that have the highest average annual payroll per employee are businesses that have between 50 and 99 employees. They earn on average about $92,000, almost $93,000 a year as an average annual payroll for each of the employees of that particular business location. And of course, you then see fairly high numbers for these really gigantic, but as you can see on the slide at the top, there's very few of them. In fact, there's so few they actually didn't even show up on the slide. So let's now change gears and talk about the bottom of that pyramid, the economic census. Every five years, we do a complete economic census of all employer businesses in the United States. So once again, it doesn't cover those self-employed people. There are a couple of exclusions. Uh, we don't count data on agriculture and some other selected industries. We've provided the link here uh, to see what that full list is. The level of geography that is shown is some of the most that we have in, the economic, in our economic programs. We go down to national, state, metro, and counties, and even places. Um, those lower areas do vary quite a bit by sector, um, again, because of that privacy law that Linda talked about. We published a number of other dimensions in the economic census for the financial insurance sector, uh, include data by business size. Uh, just like county business patterns, we have establishment size based upon employment, but we also publish establishment and firm size by, by both employment and by revenue size. So if your definition of a small finance business is one where the firm earns less than a million dollars in sales, let's say, we would have that data. Just like in county business patterns, we have legal form of organization, but we even have franchise status. And yes, there are franchises in the financial insurance sector, and the franchise data can be really valuable if you're contemplating opening a franchise versus non-franchise business because it allows you to compare the operating ratios of franchise businesses in the industry to non-franchise businesses in that same industry. It's our most detailed program in terms of the data variables that are shown. Uh, we publish core statistics on the number of businesses, employment, payroll, and sales, but we also have a lot of other sector-specific data. And as of the end of March, uh, I know we have to update these slides a little bit, we have released the data for 55% uh, percent of, the, of the U.S. in terms of the financial insurance sector, 28 states. Now, in terms of changes that you're going to see when you look at the 2017 economic census, the changes to geographies, the changes to industry codes, there's our new, brand new North American product classification system, and then a few other changes. And I'm going to quickly just talk about some of those. Uh, actually, no, I'm not. So in terms of the release of the data, this slide gives you some information about our release schedule. Right now, we are in the midst of releasing our geographic area statistics, uh, which started being uh, released in January, and those data will continue through November, although I do hear from good authority uh, that it's likely we will complete earlier than November. To help users understand what data have been released um, as of today, we have provided this really nice infograph. I'm not going to really have a chance to demo it for you, unfortunately, um, just in, in the spirit of getting us uh, to, to Linda Laughlin, so to give her some time. Um, but we have this really nice infograph that allows you to go ahead and see 
for the financial insurance sector, and for that matter, all sectors, which states have we released? So as you can see on the slide, the, the states that are highlighted, um, the Pacific Coast states and the Atlantic Coast states that are highlighted in the blue outline and the peach fill are the states that we have released the data for the financial insurance sector. One of the really nice features of this visualization is when you click on a given state, um, you get a pop-up that provides information that provides information about what's been released so far, but more importantly, it provides a deep link into our brand new data.census.gov platform. Some of our users have commented that finding the data that they care about can be a little challenging using our new platform. It's very different from the original uh, data that we had released on American Fact Finder. Uh, so this visualization makes it really easy for people to be able to get um, into, um, into the data directly. So for example, um, if I were to you click on this link for the state of Connecticut, the application would bring you right into data.census.gov looking just like this. So you can see we're looking at the data for the state of Connecticut. For all of the two, three, four, five, and six digit NAICS codes in the financial insurance sector. So it's a nice shortcut to get to the data. Now, a lot of users have said, okay, Gandhi, this is all great, but what if I care about data for more than just the state of Connecticut? If I want to look at metros or if I want to look at, at um, data for counties in Connecticut or cities in Connecticut, how can I use those links in this visualization here to be able to get to the more detailed geographic data? And the simple answer is this geography button that you see highlighted in blue in the menu bar at the top of the display. Right now, we are looking at data for one geography, in this case, Connecticut. If I wanted to look at data specifically for the city of Hartford, so to understand the insurance industry in the city of Hartford, Connecticut, I can click on this geography menu, and it would, the application would allow me to go in and change the geography from Connecticut to Hartford, Connecticut. I could then look at other counties in the U.S. or in the state. So it's a really nice way to get to the data without having to wade through all of those menus. Now just to give you a snippet of what the data we've, we've released so far uh, for the financial insurance sector as part of the economic census, this is looking at the insurance industry um, in California for, its, for selected counties, the top counties in California. And as you can clearly see, Los Angeles County clearly dominates uh, in terms of the, the employment in the insurance carrier industry uh, by county. Over 42,000, nearly 43,000 people work for insurance carriers in Los Angeles County, followed by about 17,000 working for insurance carriers in Orange County. Um, very often you see employment in industries mirroring the population in those geographies. But every once in a while, you see cases where the employment in a particular industry doesn't follow with the demographics, where there might be a particular company headquartered in an area that is causing a big spike, a big increase in the number of employees in that industry that doesn't sort of coincide with the population. So these data can be really valuable to understand the concentration, if you will, of certain types of businesses in certain geographic areas. Now, as we're releasing data from the economic census, we wanted to also um, alert to people uh, what's been released using social media. And one of the things we thought about doing was sending out in Facebook and in other social media platforms these fun facts. So what you're looking at right now are the fun facts that we have released so far for the financial insurance sector. In the top left-hand corner, we have the financial insurance sector data for the state of Massachusetts. And in the bottom right-hand corner, we have the fun facts for New York State, uh, the state where I actually grew up in. Um, we have provided here on the slide a link to our visualizations page where you can go in and look at the other fun facts that have been released. And yes, we will be releasing some additional fun facts for other states for the financial insurance sector in the coming weeks. So that brings us to our Spotlight Survey, the Annual Capital Expenditure Survey. I'm going to go through this very quickly here. When we think about capital spending, 
most people sort of immediately think of the industries that have a lot of capital investments that are very dependent upon capital, um, capitalized equipment and structures. So certainly the manufacturing sector um, that is, um, would be a, an industry that we would clearly see as being important in the, finance, in, the, in the capital expenditure survey. But the funny thing is the financial insurance sector actually has a lot of spending in this industry as well, in capital spending as well, and the annual capital expenditure survey actually is a great resource to be able to look at capital spending even in this industry. This is an annual program and provides information on both new and used structures and equipment, um, and it covers all domestic, private, non-farm businesses. Uh, it is one of those programs that Linda talked about before that include both employers and the self-employed people, non-employers. So this gives you just a, a, a taste of what the total capital expenditures is um, by major industry sector for 2018, as well as some data for 2017 and 2016. And I've highlighted in this table the row for the financial insurance sector. You can see that there certainly are some sectors like manufacturing that are quite a bit larger. Um, in 2018, the capital spending, um, capital expenditures in the manufacturing sector were, were about $259 billion. Uh, these, are, these numbers are in millions of dollars, so $259 billion, but it was about $181 billion when it comes to the financial insurance sector. And you'll notice if you look down the table, that's actually the second ranked sector in terms of capital spending. You may be kind of wondering what type of capital spending would that include? Well, certainly it's IT equipment expenditures that financial insurance businesses spend on maintaining their IT infrastructure to run their finance businesses and their insurance businesses. Um, in fact, when you compare the spending for manufacturing in 2018 to the spending in finance in 2018 and you look at the percent change, the manufacturing spending was up 4.9% from 2017, whereas the spending for the financial insurance sector was actually up 11.4% in 2018. So this industry certainly uh, is, spends a lot of money, um, and again, it's a second ranked in terms of this. So the last thing I'm going to say before I turn it over to my colleague Linda is our data tool, uh, one of our data tools that provides access to this data. Said this business builder. I'm not going to get a chance, unfortunately, to demo it for you, but CBB has two editions. The first edition is our small business edition. This tool lets you go in and actually look at demographic and business data by geography, and it allows you to provide, to display that data in a map format as well as in reports. What we're looking at right now is a map looking at the depository credit inter intermediation business, so banks, if you will, um, and we're looking at total employment of employer businesses, and I have clicked on New York County. You can see that highlighted across the top and highlighted on the map. There's about 66,000, almost 67,000 people that work for banking in New York County, so that is um, the New York City um, Manhattan sort of area. The second edition of Census Business Builder is our Regional Analyst Edition. Uh, regional Analyst Edition is a little different from the Small Business Edition, with the primary difference being it lets me build my own custom geography. So let's say I was interested in looking at the insurance industry in the city of Hartford, Connecticut, and in some of the neighboring cities around Hartford. As many of you know, um, Hartford, Connecticut is a major hub of the insurance industry, but as you can see on this map, there's actually a lot of insurance carriers to the north of Hartford and just to the west of Hartford. So what I have gone in and done is I've built this custom region that looks at not only the city of Hartford, Connecticut, which is highlighted, but also each of the other cities that surround it. And once I have then built this custom region, I can then look at all of the businesses, all the employment, all the payroll, and all the demographics of people that live in this particular area to kind of compare the demographics of those communities to the businesses that are there. So this is a really nice tool. It was designed primarily for chambers of commerce and other regional planning authorities, 
but we also have emergency managers that are now using this to be able to understand the potential impacts of weather events on certain areas of the country. So with this, I want to go ahead and just remind us again that today's webinar is the second in our series. Um, we're covering the financial insurance sector. In May, we're going to be doing one on the education sector, and you can see the rest of the schedule off to the right. So with that, I'd like to, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Linda Laughlin, to talk about the American Community Survey. My name is uh, Linda Laughlin. I'm a chief of the Industry and Occupation Statistics Branch at the U.S. Census Bureau, and I will be speaking to you today about the American Community Survey, also known as the ACS. Um, unlike the data that was presented to you by Andy, my focus will be more on workers. So this will be individuals um, who apply to household surveys um, and not really on businesses or establishments um, like many of the numbers that you've seen. Uh, I will provide a brief overview of ACS, um, some data estimates and products related to this topic. So the ACS is the nation's most current, reliable, and accessible data source for local statistics. The survey samples approximately 3.5 million addresses each year, and these data are collected continuously throughout the year to produce annual social, economic, housing, and demographic estimates. The data collected through ACS is used to distribute more than $675 billion of federal government spending each year. ACS estimates cover more than 40 topics, support more than 300 known federal uses, and countless non-federal uses. The primary topics from ACS that I will cover today include industry. This is the type of business conducted by a person's employer. Occupation, this is the main job title and work duties associated with that job. And class of worker, this is the type of ownership of one's employing organization. As I mentioned before, I will focus on estimates for workers since the ACS is a household survey. Information about a person's work is collected via a series of write-in questions on the ACS. We then take this write-in data and code it. Um, data for industry is coded one to the census industry code list that you can crosswalk to the NAICS. And information related to occupation is code, coded to the census occupation code list, which can then be crosswalked to the standard occupational classification system, also known as SOC or SOC. The Census Bureau releases three different sets of data estimates in regards to the ACS each year in the form of one-year and five-year period data sets, as well as one-year supplemental estimates. Um, so we know that the, the one-year estimates are typically released in September of each year, whereas the five-year estimates are released in, typically in December. So the content collected by the American Community Survey can be grouped into four main types of characteristics, social, demographic, economic, and housing. As you can see, there are many different types under each category. Specific to today's topic, finance and insurance, the ACS does have topics including employment, as well as industry and occupation, which can be seen under the economic characteristics. I also want to point out that the American Community Survey also collects basic demographic characteristics such as sex, age, race, and Hispanic origin. This is the same information collected on the decennial census. Collecting demographic characteristics allows the ACS to pair demographics with other data topics in order to provide more detailed estimates to the public. The, to the topics encompassed by ACS are used to produce more than 1,000 tables that are published on data.census.gov for local communities, re resulting in more than 11 billion estimates each year. So earlier I mentioned there are three sets of data estimates released by ACS each year. So let me provide some quick information on those products. These products are released about one year after the data are collected. Therefore, data is always one year prior to the current calendar year. ACS one-year estimates, which combine data collected over a 12-month period, are available for geographic areas with a population of 65,000 or more. So these are large counties state, and national level statistics. ACS one-year supplemental estimates are a subset of detailed tables that are available for geographic areas with a population of 20,000 or more. They are simplified versions of popular tables and provide the most current data for almost twice as many geographies compared with the standard one-year tables. 
ACS five-year estimates combine data collected over a 60-month period and are available for geographic areas of all sizes. Basically, ACS data are available for geographic areas with a population of 20,000 or more in the form of one-year and five-year estimates. Data for geographic areas with a population of less than 20,000 are only available in the five-year estimates. We also released the one-year and five-year public use microdata sample, or PUMS, for users who want to create custom tables that are not pre-tabulated. So this slide is an example of a public data table that you can access from data.census.gov. Highlighted, um, highlighted here, um, you'll see estimates for the finance and insurance and real estate and realty and leasing industry. Due to sample size and lack of specificity from respondents, we often need to collapse industry groups together for many of our published data products. So here, for this particular table, we've had to collapse sectors 52 and 53 to show particular estimates by industry for the civilian employed population 16 and over. However, in the next few slides, I will share tables that are more specific to finance, to the finance and insurance sector. Another way of looking at this data to use, is to use the mapping function in the data.census.gov tool. Displayed here is the default map you get from the, the census tool, but you can modify as needed. This table here provides more specific estimates for the finance and insurance industry. And in particular, this table looks at it by sex for full-time year-round workers. Overall, in 2018, there were around 6.2 million workers in this sector. Women represent, represented over half of the finance and insurance industry workers at 55.1%. ACS also provides median earnings for workers by industry and occupation. Our, meeting, our median earnings tables are only for full-time year-round workers, which I will discuss the importance of in the next slide. As shown here, in 2018, the workers in the finance and insurance industry had median earnings of $65,078 higher than the median earnings for all workers across all industries, which you can see in the top total here of $48,565. ACS data shows median earnings. In addition to industry, ACS provides estimates for detailed occupations. Here we've selected occupations related to the finance and insurance industry. Detailed median earnings by men and women, as well as women's earnings as a percentage of men's earnings. Occupations include accountants, auditors, insurance underwriters, tax preparers, and the percentage of women in each occupational group is also reported. So this gives you sort of a sense of both the, the demographic, this is one of the great uses that we always talk about with ACS is that you can, this great demographic detail to look at various different characteristics of the working population. These are additional detailed occupations that often overlap with the finance and insurance industry. Examples include fi financial managers, project managers, uh, project management specialists, and personal uh, financial advisors. Data users can use our PUMS data set to look specifically at occupations by selected industries, although we do have a limited number of tables already published on data.census.gov. And this last table provides estimates on the number of self-employed workers in, collapse, in the collapse category of finance and insurance, real estate, and rental and leasing industry. This table is an example of basically how to use our class of worker data to look at self-employed workers. Here you'll see that overall, 8% of workers in this sector report being self-employed. For additional information on ACS, I encourage you to sign up for ACS alerts and to visit the main ACS page where you can get tutorials on how to use the data.census.gov um, data tool. You can also um, encourage you to follow Census on our various forms of social media, including Twitter and Facebook. And from that, I turn this back over to Linda Lee. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Andy and Linda, for presenting our audience with information on finance statistics available from the Census Bureau and how to access the data. Thank you, everyone, for your interest in our data and for attending today's webinar. If you have questions regarding the 2020 decennial census, please use the contact information provided here. We also listed information for our data dissemination specialists. This is for anyone who may be interested in a hands-on in-person training. We have specialists assigned by geography that will be able to provide this service. I want to thank you everyone for taking the time out of your day today to attend today's webinar. Have a great day.